Well, welcome to another episode of Christian Answers. My name is Pastor Jeff Short. Glad to have you along for the journey today. Today I'm going to talk about a topic that is popping up in the news quite a bit these days, and that is the whole issue of when organizations, when churches, when political parties have someone in their midst that has become publicly unpopular, they have a tendency to want to throw that person under the bus and then move on. They want to break association with that person and want to separate from that from that person. And sometimes, and a lot of times actually, that is justified. And I was giving a Bible study the other day from 2 Samuel 20, where it talks about a similar situation and where it is justified in severing ties with a person for the sake of the wider organization. It says in 2 Samuel 20, verse 14, it picks up, it says, Sheba passed through all the tribes of Israel to Abel, Beth, Makkah, and through the entire region of the Berates, who gathered together and followed him. All the troops with Joab came and besieged Sheba in Abel, they built a siege ramp up to the city, and it stood against the outer fortifications. While they were battering the wall to, the brink, to bring it down, a wise woman called from the city, Listen, listen, tell Joab to come here so I can speak to him. And he went forward to her, and she asked, Are you Joab? And he says, I am. She said, Listen to me, what I want to say to you. I'm listening, he said. Long ago, they used to say, get your answer at, at Abel, and that settled it. We are a peaceful and faithful uh, city of Israel. You are trying to destroy our city that is the mother in Israel. Why do you want to swallow up the Lord's inheritance? So Sheba is a rebel against King David. He is trying to overthrow King David. Joab is the commander of David's army, and he is trying to chase Sheba down and eliminate that rebellion in the kingdom. And so Sheba has holed up in the city of Abel, and a wise woman comes to the wall. It's a fortified city. It has a huge wall. Uh, in the ancient times, back in those days, the people of a city would build a fortification, and then when an enemy came, they would all go into the fortification, and the enemy could not get to them because of the high walls and the massive defensive structures that were built along the city. And so uh, Sheba is in this fortified city of Abel, and a wise woman comes to the wall on top, way up above, and says, hey, Joab, commander of David's army, why are you doing this? And Joab says, far be it from me, Joab replied, far be it from me to swallow up or destroy. That is not the case. A man named Sheba, son of Bikri, from the hill country of Ephraim, has lifted up his hand against the king, against David. Hand him over, and I will withdraw from this city. So the offer was, give us that man Sheba, and we'll go home, and we will not assault your city. And the woman said to Joab, his head will be thrown to you from the wall. Then the woman went to all the people with her wise advice, and they cut off the head of Sheba, son of Bikri, and threw it to Joab, so it, he sounded the trumpet, and his men dispersed from the city, each returning to his home, and Joab went back to the king in Jerusalem. So, the people got together, Joab uh, had made them an offer, and said, if you turn over the Sheba, we will stop assaulting your city, you will live, just give us this one man, and we will be satisfied. Now, in their case, they were justified in turning this man over because this man had committed crimes. He was uh, committing treason against the king. He was a rebel against the king, and he was a danger to the whole kingdom. But what, had, what would have happened if Sheba had not been guilty? What would have happened if Sheba had not been a rebel against the king? What would have happened, for example, if he were someone like a John the Baptist? If you recall John the Baptist in the New Testament, he spoke out against King Herod and said, you are an adulterer, you divorced your wife and married your brother's wife. That is a sin. And so he spoke out harshly, prophetically against King Herod. And as you all know, King Herod had him arrested 
and had him beheaded. Well, what if King, King Herod had been chasing John the Baptist and John the Baptist came into a city like Abel, a fortified city, and King Herod's forces had said, give us John the Baptist's head or we will continue to assault and destroy your city. Then in that case, the citizens would not have been justified in turning over John the Baptist because he had done nothing wrong. He had done no crime. Uh, he was not guilty of anything. He was a prophet. He was speaking the truth to the powerful King Herod, and he was agitating the king. He was bothering the king, but he wasn't sinning against the king. Uh, in contrast to Sheba, who was actually trying to do a rebellion in the kingdom and uh, challenge David's authority, uh, John the Baptist was speaking prophetic truth to Herod. And if Herod had had a similar scenario where he had uh, found John the Baptist in a fortified city and said to the city, hand him over or I will destroy your whole city, if the citizens got together, they should not have handed over John the Baptist. They should have said to the soldiers, this man is innocent. He is a prophet. He is speaking the truth, and he has done no crime. We will not hand him over. They should not have handed him over in the John the Baptist scenario, while the other scenario, the true actual story in the Old Testament, they handed him over because he was a criminal. Now, what does this have to do with anything well, in society today, we see the phenomenon of, for example, in the media world, a media outlet, a network, will fire someone, a reporter or an announcer or an anchorman, if that person has said something offensive to the crowd or said something offensive to some group, and there's a boycott and there's all kinds of controversy, and a lot of times the media companies will simply say this person is so controversial in what they said, we will fire him and that will end the controversy. We won't continue to have this day after day bad publicity in, our, in, our, in the newspapers and on television and radio. And so we will solve the problem. We will crisis management this problem by firing the offensive person. Even though if he said something true, we still may fire him because of the controversy. In fact, there now there are uh, businesses, for example, like a Starbucks, where there might be someone, a manager, who takes a certain action and makes a decision on the spot. The decision isn't necessarily wrong, but it causes offense, and it causes a lot of controversy in society. And so Starbucks may elect to go ahead and fire the manager, even though the manager didn't do anything wrong, because of the controversy that his decision caused the organization. And it's a whole lot easier a lot of times to just solve the problem by firing the person, whether he's innocent or guilty, than to somehow defend the person and whether the publicity storm, the public relations storm, and you see this happen sometimes in Christian organizations where you actually have someone speaking truth. For example, you may have a pastor who is being faithful to the Scripture. He's a Bible-believing, godly pastor. He's speaking the truth of God. And 10, 20 years ago, he, he is on tape saying, that the Bible upholds the mar marriage is a man and a woman. There is no other definition of marriage, and so-called gay marriage is not marriage, and there is only one definition of marriage, and that's a man and a woman for a lifetime. And the pastor is simply giving the biblical Christian teaching on this subject. There's nothing controversial 20 years ago about this, and he was on tape, and it was, it was widely known that he believed this, but some media outlet, some network, some left-wing, far-left, progressive LGBT group gets a hold of a tape of a pastor of a large church saying that the LGBT movement is wrong and that there's no such thing as gay marriage and the only marriage is a man and a woman and so on and so forth, and they 
cause offense, they cause controversy, they steer controversy up to the point where this tape, videotape of the pastor goes viral, it's seen by millions of people on YouTube, it's repeated over and over endlessly on radio and television, and all of a sudden activist groups jump on and they start demanding that this man be fired from his position. And now the real test of the church comes into play. The real test of what this organization, this Christian organization will do. The whole of society, the secular world and the media world, and the perception is everyone, but it's not everyone, but it's the media world, is calling for this man's firing because he offended the quote, LGBT community, and then others have piled on because they're virtue signaling and they want to show that they're support and they want to be allies to the LGBT cause, even though they aren't. So now they're jumping on. And even Christian organizations and Christian groups are jumping on and calling for his resignation because they want to position themselves in society to be popular and with it and cool, and they don't want to be seen as anti-anything, and they want to be friendly and community seeker-friendly, so they're jumping on the bandwagon. So pretty much everyone's against this pastor who, for speaking prophetically the Word of God 20 years ago in a tape that was unearthed by an LGB activist group to try to cause trouble, and now the elders of the church have to get together and say, what are we going to do? And the people of the church have to respond in a godly way. And you know what happens most of the time? You know what happens most of the time? If it's a big enough church with a big enough influence base, and it's trying to be relevant and cool and hip in the culture, most out of nine times out of ten, they will throw their pastor under the bus in order to maintain their status in society. And that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy, because here is a prophet speaking the truth, the hard truth, to a culture that doesn't want to hear it, and the people of God, the so-called people of God, the congregation members and the uh, mature leaders of the church, get together, and instead of handling this in a godly way, they will throw the person under the bus and say, Pastor, we love you. You didn't say anything wrong, but it's just so controversial. It's so toxic. It's so hot. We're going to have to dismiss you for the sake of our organization. We have a big mortgage to pay. We have all these people who come to our church. If we take a real hard stand on this and defend you, It'll be perceived in the papers as if we're anti-LGBT. We want to be friends with that community. We want to reach them for Jesus and so on and so forth. So we're going to have to get rid of you, throw you under the bus, turn you over. And it's a tragedy. It's We're sorry, but we're going to have to do it for the good of the organization. No, that is a cowardly, that is a non-biblical, non-Christian response. And... I need to say to people and organizations, denominations, and churches, don't do that kind of thing. You need to stand behind your prophets and those who speak the Word of God. If you, do, if you don't stand behind, you're going to compromise the gospel, you're going to compromise the Word of God, and you're going to be good for nothing, because if you are saying the same thing the culture says, then you have no reason to exist. You are just uh, redundancy. Uh, you might as well just disband the church because there's no prophetic calling. Now, there is a situation that is not quite the same as that, but it's similar, and that is with the Southern Baptist Convention right now. Um, the president of the seminary in Texas, the Southern Baptist Seminary in Texas, Paige Patterson, made some very insensitive and very, I believe that they're wrong. It's the wrong advice. Um, a woman came to him in an abusive marriage situation, and she said, what should I do? And Paige Patterson said, uh, don't leave your husband. Pray for him that God changes his heart. Well, she came back a few weeks later, and she had a bruise on her face, and she came up to him and she said, I hope you're happy 
And he said something to the effect, well, yes, I am, because God can still reach him. And he didn't counsel her to leave the abusive situation. He didn't apologize for her, his, advi- his initial advice. He showed a little bit of insensitivity. And so that counsel, that uh, record of that counsel was brought up recently because he recounted it in a sermon a couple 20 years ago, I think it was. And now the call is for him to be fired, and he actually was fired from being president of this seminary based on this uh, counsel that he gave. Now, the question is, was the counsel that he gave wrong? And two, should he have been fired? Well, I believe that the counsel that he gave was wrong. Uh, Maybe not the initial counsel that he gave. For example, if the woman said that she was in an abusive relationship and Paige Patterson, as a pastor, counseled her to uh, stick it out, pray for him, uh, don't leave just yet, uh, continue to persevere in prayer and pray for God's protection and pray that God changes your husband's heart and gets him to church and works a miracle in him. And that initial advice from Paige Patterson is not wrong. Um, There are many pastors, there are many counselors, there are many Christian godly uh, counselors who say to the woman who comes in and says, I am in an abusive uh, relationship, they don't always advise to leave that relationship. They don't always advise. It depends on the level of the abuse. It depends on the level of that uh, violence. If, 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 yes, if she's being bruised, yes, but the initial conversation that Paige Patterson had with this woman didn't seem to indicate that she was being uh, abused in that way, that you could have her see her and that she had a bruise on her. In that case, uh, then he should uh, have actually met with the husband and tried to get a counseling session with the husband and say, look, you can't do this, and the other elders of the church should have met with the husband. But the initial conversation, as I understand it, was the woman just wanted his advice and that she had experienced abuse, but he didn't counsel her to leave. And I I don't think he necessarily had to counsel her to leave in that initial conversation. But then when she came back to him and said, I hope you're happy. Now, her attitude was not correct in the first place. Okay, she can't blame Paige Patterson, the pastor and the president of the seminary, for her husband's abusive behavior toward him. She can't lay all of that on Paige Patterson. So her attitude to come to Paige Patterson with a bruised cheek or something and say, see this? My husband abused me. I hope you're happy. You know, that is unfair. That is wrong. She should never have done that. And I think his response was in response to her unfair response. So she came at him and accused him of a wrong. And his reply was out of pride, was out of defensiveness, was out of standing up for himself. And so he says, yeah, I'm happy because God still can work in his life and still bring about a miracle. That was wrong advice. That was wrong counsel. That was wrong reaction by Paige Patterson. And he should apologize for that. You see, the problem there is he never apologized. His initial reaction Well, yeah, you know, it was basically you can't blame this on me and just don't try to do anything that you'll regret later and stick with it and God can save your husband and work in his life and your marriage can be restored. He was reacting against her unfair accusation that he was the cause of her problems and he wasn't. He wasn't. Okay. But He should have, upon reflection, this most recent, when the tape was disclosed and the whole controversy brewed, he should have come before the people and said, I am sorry, that was not very good counsel, 
And I shouldn't have reacted in that way. I should have been more sensitive to the woman and her needs. And while, and when I realized that her husband was hitting her and abusing her physically, I should have been more forceful in taking some kind of action to help her alleviate her from that situation, whether that meant to separate from your husband even temporarily until he can be trusted again or to do something other than just say, well, uh, you know, that's your problem or stick with it or whatever. It was a very harsh, uh, insensitive counsel that he gave her and he should have apologized. He should have said to the Christian world, I'm sorry, that was not, if I could do that over, I would do that over. Upon reflection, looking back on that, that was, that was horrible. I should have been more sensitive and tried to be more helpful instead of being defensive at her accusation of me and so on and so forth. So that was the problem with Paige Patterson. Now, the Southern Baptist Seminary down there fired him from president and they are disavowing themselves and disassociating themselves with him. And we don't know the whole uh, conversation down there. I, I don't. We don't know if he. They came back to Paige Patterson and said, "Are you willing to apologize for this and stop defending it?" And I don't know what the conversation was. I think if he were willing to apologize for that uh, bad counsel and that bad reaction, that defensive reaction that he made toward the woman, I don't think he should automatically be. Um, fired. Now, there is a uh, consultant and a professor named Ed Stetzer who was on a podcast recently being interviewed by Christianity Today magazine, and he says, oh, yes, he, he, uh, he needs to be, uh, he needs not only to be fired, but he should not give the address at the Southern Baptist Convention, the annual convention, because if he does, then all the headlines will appear in the next day's newspaper, Southern Baptists don't care about abuse, and so on and so forth. So for public relations uh, reasons, he needs to not give that sermon that he's scheduled to give at the annual convention. So this man's whole approach is public relations. His whole approach is PR. It's optics. It's trying to make the denomination look good in the eyes of the world so that we don't get a bad image of ourselves. Well, I think that's unhelpful because I think the people of God should be more concerned about the truth than they are about some PR campaign they need to wage to try to win the people's, persuade the people of America that they're a great organization. No, they need to sort this out. Now, if Paige Patterson is wanting to go before the people in the denomination and apologize for his remarks and then give a teaching and corrective and give a good message on how we should be sensitive to this and we shouldn't just slough it off, that abuse is a real problem, then he should be able to give the address. Even if the other secular outlets and the secular world mocks and laughs and says they shouldn't even have let him speak because the headlines, they're going to put headlines whatever. They're going to distort whatever. They're going to spin whatever. And it's a, it's a dead-end um, uh, path to try to appease the world. <coughs> but we cannot throw people under the bus in the Christian world to save our organization and to save our churches and to save uh, our Christianity. We can't just cut our people off. Paige Patterson... It was a great and is a great Christian leader. He was part of the whole uh, conservative resurgence that recaptured the seminaries and the denomination of Southern Baptist Convention from liberal, watered-down compromise that was drifting in. And he was instrumental right at the core of bringing that back. Now, he's a, he's a war horse. He's a general. He's a, he's a, he's a fighter. And these guys, you can't always expect everything out of their mouth to be uh, diplomatic. He's not a diplomat. He's not a politician. He's a war horse. He's a general. He, he's, a, he's a fighter. And a lot of times, uh, these guys, uh, for example, the guys that fought in World War II, the generals, 
they're not always the greatest guys to put in front of a microphone and have speak uh, because they're tough guys and they they're committed and they're not always uh, nuanced and they don't always come across with the right attitudes. They're flawed, but but we can't throw these people under the bus because we have to give them honor and respect for what they've accomplished. And Paige Patterson has accomplished a lot in his lifetime. And he shouldn't be thrown under the bus by the Southern Baptist Convention because he gave bad advice and exhibited a bad attitude toward a woman who was putting him on the defensive and coming at him and accusing him of causing her problems. Yes, he made mistakes. Yes, he should have counseled differently. Yes, he should have apologized uh, most recently when it became clear that what he had counseled was wrong. But you can't forget everything he's done, and you can't throw him under the bus, and you can't just disassociate yourself and cut yourself away from him for public relations reasons. That is not the Christian way. The Christian forgives, the Christian uh, appreciates people who have done a good job in leadership, in all kinds of other areas. We don't judge a person based on one little thing in his life. This man did not commit immorality. This man did not commit sexual abuse. This man did not uh, commit physical abuse. Um, This man gave bad counsel, and he should have apologized for that, giving that counsel many years ago, and he shouldn't have displayed the defensive attitude, but he did. And what I'm hoping will happen is that, one, he will be allowed to speak at the Southern Baptist Convention. He will be allowed to apologize for his defensive attitude and his bad initial counsel to this woman, and that he will be able to continue to be a part of the Southern Baptist world and not be shunned and not be thrown under the bus and not be cut off like they did in Soviet Union. You know, when a a political person was out of favor, they would just take him out of the picture, erase him right out of Photoshop him right out of the picture before Photoshop was around. We don't do that in the Christian world. We don't uh, judge people like that and just callously cut them off. That's wrong also. So we need to pray for the Southern Baptist denomination, the convention, pray that they do the right thing and not just throw this guy under the bus, but at the same time, let the world know that his advice about that initial problem was wrong and that he needed to uh, apologize and that they love him, they respect what he's done, and he may not be the best person to be the president of the Southern Baptist Convention uh, Seminary in Texas, but he's still a respected person in the convention. So I hope this all works out. Pray about it, and we'll see you back next week on another edition of Christian Answers. God bless.